What's going on everyone? This is Sean from All Things EV and I've got Rob Maurer from Tesla Daily back on the show. Rob, welcome. It's been about a year, hasn't it, since uh, you were last on? Yeah. Oh man, probably time flies. <laughs> a lot has happened since then. A lot has happened. It's been a crazy, crazy year for Tesla, crazy year for the world. I think we're all glad to be into 2021. And a, and a fantastic year for you. You, when we, when we last spoke, you had just started your YouTube channel. And over the last year, you've had quite a bit of success. Uh, you crossed over a special number, didn't you, of subscribers? Yeah, uh, 100,000 probably a couple months back. It's been pretty crazy. And, you know, obviously I focus on, on Tesla as a stock mostly or as a, as a business, not necessarily just a stock. But, um, yeah, it's kind of been surprising to see just, you know, how many people out there are interested in, in that uh, aspect of Tesla. You also bought a Model 3. So congratulations on that. It was a long time coming, I gathered. Yeah, super long time coming. So I um, I had a day one reservation back in uh, 2016 before they even you know showed the vehicle. I drove down to Illinois to the closest store. Uh, I live in Wisconsin, so and uh, stood in line. I think there were like 100 people ahead of me, and uh, yeah, made my reservation. I never ended up converting on it until recently, just because it wasn't really you know I wasn't there um, in the point in my life where I was ready yet. You know, my car was still working, and I don't drive a lot, so I didn't really need it, and. I'm pretty frugal, so you know Teslas. Even though they've brought the cost down, are still pretty expensive vehicles, uh, and interested in the stock. So I've you know put every every dollar I could into the into the stock rather than the product, and now finally felt like uh, the time was right. And I do want to get some hands-on experience uh, just with the vehicle, and especially now as uh, autonomy gets more ramped up and the feature set starts to expand. I think that's something that really you need to kind of have that hands-on experience with. So felt like it was the right time now to finally convert on that after four and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> and how much how much did that go into play, getting that first-hand experience with driving the car and full self-driving and any other features that, that they released to the car? How much of that played into your purchase knowing that you're a pretty frugal guy? Yeah, the autonomy was huge. I mean, for me, you know, I've spent you know, almost a decade now reading about Tesla, reading about the cars, reading about how all of it operates and how everything works. So for me now receiving the Model 3, I took delivery a couple weeks ago. Um, it's been largely, you know, as expected. I don't think anything has been too shocking to me, but it is really great to just have that hands-on experience with autopilot, with navigate on autopilot, see how um, even simple things like navigation are working in the vehicle that you don't necessarily understand from just reading about. So. Um, yeah, it's been huge to kind of have that have that now with, with the actual product. And I'm curious to know, Tesla stock has done really, really well. Had it not done so well this last year, do you think you would have reconsidered your purchase of the vehicle? Did that have any part to play in, in your purchase of the Model 3? Yeah, I'm sure it did. Um, for me, it's sort of an opportunity cost type of thing. You know, when Tesla was a $30 billion company, I saw it having the potential to 100x um, and you know I think we're we're heading down that path from from where it started now we're at you know 800 billion dollars of the the potential to 100x is no longer there <laughs> I certainly still think you know there's potential for a 5x maybe a 10x you know we'll see but um, with with that opportunity cost when when you see such a great investment opportunity opportunity you know am I gonna pay thirty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars for a car when i feel like there's potential for another investment to 100x and turn that into um you know five million dollars or whatever that ends up being yeah five million dollars probably not uh even with financing it's still you're still subtracting that monthly payment and suddenly an 800 dollar um monthly payment becomes eighty thousand dollars a month so it's just kind of crazy when you when you feel like there is that much potential with an investment to set aside those dollars for for something else especially for you know it's a vehicle at the end of the day it's it's an amazing vehicle it's an amazing product but it is still a vehicle it gets you to point a to point b there's a lot of better things about it obviously it's great for the environment but you know i had a vehicle relatively fuel efficient and um every producing a vehicle does cause emissions too like tesla has talked about this in their um annual sort of impact report uh, they're working to bring those emissions down through the production process but for me it just you know wasn't the right time from you know where i was at with my current vehicle where i was at with the investment and um now with tesla being much more valuable the opportunity cost for me is a little bit less and then i just like you said the channel has grown a lot and 
I feel like at this point I, I need to have that that experience with the car, especially now as autonomy is you know seemingly starting to ramp up with the full self driving beta. Yeah, I think the fir the the first hand experience is fundamental to having a podcast and a YouTube channel talking specifically about Tesla. So it's I think it's going to give you a really great angle, and um, you know even as they add new features that are are bleeding edge, you're going to be able to talk about them in real time versus waiting on other people's feedback on what they think about it, you're going to be able to talk firsthand. So that's really exciting. Where I want to, I want to transition here to the meat of our conversation today, which is I want to talk about some things that are going to be fundamental for Tesla investors to keep an eye out for in 2021. We were dialoguing back and forth on topics. So, and, and we've got a, a handful. We'll probably also take some questions from Twitter as well. Some questions have come in that I think are really, really good, but I'd love to start off with maybe one of the most important things that Tesla investors need to be keeping an eye on here this year. One of the ones I think is the progress of the gigafactories in Berlin and Texas. Would you agree or disagree that those that, that that's a really fundamental part of Tesla's success in 2021? Yeah, absolutely agree. I think that's the biggest factor this year when we look at, you know, Tesla's progress and how things are going to be changing from where Tesla goes from manufacturing 300,000 vehicles per year, 500,000 vehicles per year to now having localized production on three continents, two factories here in the United States, um, three if you count, you know, Gigafactory Nevada and Fremont, um, you can combine those or keep them separate, whatever you want. But uh, we're going from Tesla just really pumping out all their production from Fremont here over the last couple of years now to having that localized production and, you know, looking to sort of four to five X their production capacity in the span of really two to three years. Um, and that's, you know, that's a dramatic shift for the company. And we heard Tesla talk a lot at Battery Day about a lot of the things that they're doing um, in addition to having that localized production. So I think watching how this unfolds over the next, you know, 12, 18 months is going to be not only important for today, but also important for how, you know, if we think about the stock, how the market perceives Tesla's potential for growth for the next decade. And I think, you know, we've seen a lot of progress in the stock this year, and a big reason for that has been Tesla's success, both with ramping up the Model Y and Gigafactory Shanghai, uh, because Tesla kind of put that out there. They set that benchmark of being able to achieve those production ramps very quickly. So if we think about Shanghai, they went from groundbreaking to producing vehicles in exactly a year. So investors now have seen that and they say, okay, for the Model Y out of Shanghai, Tesla can probably do a similar thing. So, you know, they produced 150,000 Model 3s in their first year. They can probably do the same thing for Model Y and we can start to add that, that volume in. So as we see Gigafactory Berlin, Gigafactory Texas come online, investors are really going to be watching that to see what sort of a benchmark Tesla can do there from, you know, a build out perspective. And then we'll be able to start extrapolating that uh, out to 2030, because obviously Tesla has huge ambitious plans of delivering, you know, 20 million vehicles per year by 2030, which would make them twice as large now in terms of unit volume as, you know, Toyota and Volkswagen, uh, right around 10 million per year. So a long-winded answer there, but yeah, that's the most critical thing. And, um, you know, unfortunately that means that people are going to be looking at it on, you know, a day-to-day -day basis. There are drones out there seemingly every day at, at Berlin, at Texas, tracking this progress. And, um, to some extent, I think we get a little bit too focused on that day-to-day -day progress, um, or like permitting delays at Berlin, things like that. Uh, but it is, it all, it all does come back to like that, that benchmark for, you know, how this extrapolates to Tesla's future, because a one month shift might not seem like that big of a deal, but when you then start to extrapolate that out, it, it ends up being a big deal. But if we zoom out those little delays, they're not important. It doesn't matter if Tesla, you know, it didn't matter this year if Tesla hit 500,000, it matters for investor confidence and stuff like that. But 480,000, 500,000, 520,000, they're all the same, you know? If, if we look at decades timelines, they're all the same. And I think we need to remember that as we look into 2021, you know, a lot of people think that Tesla can hit a million vehicles produced this year, which I think is possible, but if they only end up with 800,000, but they show rapid progress towards the end of the year, that's just as good to me. So um, yeah, <laughs> Giga Berlin, Giga Texas, definitely the, the two biggest things that I'm watching for 
this year in addition to you know what comes along with that with battery production and how that all progresses from what Tesla talked about about a battery day. So you're thinking that Tesla will produce somewhere around 800,000 or deliver 800,000 vehicles in 2021, is that correct? Yeah, I haven't done my full forecasting yet. Um, I think that's probably the low benchmark that I would set would be somewhere on that 800,000 level. Um, if we look back at their Q4 or their Q3 um, earnings report, they said, you know, right now we have production capacity of 840,000 vehicles. So for them to say that and to come off, um, you know, Q4's production of 180,000, that extrapolates to 720,000 per year. There's never been a year where Tesla hasn't exceeded their Q4 production run rate the following year. So 720,000, 800,000, I think that's a, a really low benchmark. And then depending on what happens with the Model Y ramp up at Shanghai, Gigafactory Texas, Gigafactory Berlin, and how, how rapid those um, production ramps are able to um, be, be accomplished, the we could definitely see you know pretty significant upside to that if Berlin and Texas can follow sort of a similar timeline that Shanghai did. Can, in your opinion, Tesla reach this 800,000 without Giga Berlin and Texas? How crucial are those two manufacturing plants, in your opinion? Yeah, and that's why I say, like, to me, 800,000 or so is sort of a starting point, um, because I think they can get to that with Fremont and with, um, with Shanghai. Because if we look at Shanghai, you know, the last three months of the quarter, or last three months of the year, so Q4, they've been producing around 20,000 vehicles per month. So around 60,000 a quarter, 240, 250,000 a year uh, in terms of the actual production run rate. So if they can do 250,000 Model 3s, 150,000, you know, um, Model Ys in their first year, like they did with the Model 3, should be pretty simply 400,000 out of uh, Shanghai. They've got capacity in Fremont for, they say, 590,000. We haven't seen that run rate yet. Uh, but, you know, if they do 400,000 out of Shanghai, it should be pretty simple to also get 400,000 out of, out of Fremont. Um, that wouldn't be too far off what they did this year with the pandemic, which they were shut down in Fremont for seven weeks, probably missed about 50,000 units in production there. So there's a, there's a really clear path to, you know, 800, 850,000 from just Fremont and Shanghai. And then like, like a, I just layer up from there as sort of a question mark and a bonus any production that we would get from uh, Berlin and Texas. And could that be 150,000 units? I think so. Um, and that would get us to a million, but you know, we're, we're still in the, the still in the build out process. So I, I definitely wouldn't be extremely confident in, in that right now. And I don't expect Tesla to, to guide for that or anything like that. I'm, I'm extremely hopeful for this distribution of manufacturing. It really seemed like with just uh, Fremont, it strained a lot of the production process, not just production, but build quality, customer experience. When they had to ship out as many cars as possible from Fremont, I, I suspect, and this is a wild guess here based on my experience behind the scenes, but, but not any inside information, that, that stress of having to produce vehicles from one from a singular place and send them out globally negatively impacts the bill quality and customer experience. And so I'm e extremely hopeful that this r distribution of manufacturing plants will allow Tesla to bring back in, to rein in the bill quality, um, which seems to be, in my personal opinion, a little bit hit or miss. I'm, you know, from time to time, I get people reach out to me and owners ask for help or they're frustrated um, with the initial experience taking delivery of their vehicle. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that this, this really does start to address some of those things that maybe are um, risks or complaints about Tesla uh, around the, the sort of sporadic build quality of, of their vehicles. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely do. I have a couple. I think starting off the localized manufacturing on, you know, an individual continent, that's huge from a financial perspective. That's going to allow Tesla to really bring costs down. If we look at what they did in China, once they introduced the Model 3 there, they brought, you know, the starting prices down by about 30%. I think when Giga Berlin comes online, we're probably going to see something pretty similar there. Um, and then Tesla, that's also going to allow Tesla to just bring costs down across the board because they're going to have 
um, more localized manufacturing. They're going to have more production, more economies of scale. It's all just going <laughs> to slowly and some, somewhat suddenly drag down costs. So on the build quality point, um, I'm not sure how much the localized manufacturing would have there, but I think when we start to see Tesla get to a little bit more of a comfortable place where they don't feel like every quarter they're you know, their short shorts are on fire. Um, I think hopefully that'll allow us to, or allow Tesla to spend a little bit more time, a little bit more focus on those quality things. And I, I do think Tesla has done that. Um, certainly some owners have horrible situations and, you know, definitely feel for those circumstances because it's super frustrating. You know, you love this company, you save up all this money to buy, you know, probably the second most expensive thing you've, you've purchased in your life that with this vehicle a secondary to a home. And, you know, then you have a bad, bad experience and working with Tesla, maybe they don't solve it. That's so frustrating. Um, but at the same time, Tesla's delivering half a million vehicles and, you know, how many, how many owners are having stories like that? It's certainly not all of them because that would just be, you know, that would overwhelm social media, would overwhelm the company uh, and Tesla wouldn't be able to be successful. So it's tough because we don't have much data to tell us, you know, how rampant these, you know, suggested quality issues are other than the fact that there are definitely some quality issues in some circumstances. So long-winded way of long-winded way of saying just like I, I think that as Tesla now is familiar with being a high volume manufacturer and as they get more experience with manufacturing which you know manufacturing in multiple locations is going to allow them to do to some extent hopefully that will help them solve these quality issues and just again, being such a high volume player that they're moving into now, they're going to have to do that because they can't handle high volume of complaints or high volume of, of rework. So it's, it is beneficial to Tesla certainly to improve and, you know, perfect those things as much as possible. I totally agree. And I, I want to emphasize the fact that I don't believe that the build quality issues are widespread. They tend to be from my observation around end of the quarter and this rush to deliver as many cars as possible to meet um, expectations for, for uh, quarterly deliveries. Um, you know, the, the, the end of the quarter rush, I think, in some ways works to Tesla's disadvantage. It's almost like, um, you know, a chicken with its head cut off, uh, trying to get as many things done at, at the last minute. Um, so, you know, having having a, a distribution of manufacturing, I think, will relieve a lot of that stress and pressure of a single plant having to push out as many cars as possible. And, um, you know, si since I since I deal with some of these complaints on a regular basis, I, uh, I'm, I I'm thinking that this is one of Tesla's ways that they're going to address some of those maybe not so great experiences and every company has those. Um, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to zero in on it. And I know that critics of Tesla can tend to magnify those experiences and, and, and make them larger, uh, make them feel more common than they really are. But nonetheless, as someone who is an investor in Tesla, a, a, a Tesla club leader here in Denver, um, and just an overall enthusiast and supporter of the company, I don't like to hear when someone has a bad experience or when someone's having a difficult time getting in touch with Tesla. These, these are all, I think, organizational things that I'm confident, based on conversations behind the scenes, that Tesla is working on. And a lot of the, a lot of the complaints have improved and are getting better. And I don't think that Tesla just doesn't care. I think I think that's a a false narrative in my opinion and you raise a really good point there about the the impact of that quarterly wave and how that can impact the quality it just gives the delivery people a lot less time to solve some of these issues that maybe could be solved in post-production obviously you, you want it to be great right off the line but that's not the reality of car manufacturing and when Tesla has this, these quarterly waves where they're shipping vehicles over to Europe, over to Asia, um, you know, before Shanghai existed, 
they they do that in the beginning of the quarter and then you know that last month six weeks of production that's all just hitting these delivery centers all at once and they're having to do you know three months of work in four weeks so to your point and i think this is probably where you were going originally with the build quality as tesla can spread that out where they're not having to ship things internationally anymore because of that localized manufacturing across continents that's going to allow them a lot more time throughout the quarter to have it just less pressurized in those final you know three or four weeks of the quarter um, and hopefully that allows these you know delivery teams and service centers um, more time to correct a lot of those things that uh, might be a little bit problematic for someone to take delivery of and maybe just opens up more time for them to be more communicative with customers that are having issues too. So yeah, I think that's a really great point. And um, I think that does unlock a lot of opportunity. Speaking of delivery numbers, when you look at 2021, of course, Tesla is humming on Model 3 and Model Y. What other vehicles or products have you the most excited about having the biggest impact on Tesla's bottom line? We've, we've heard some rumblings of possibly a rework of Model S and X. They recently shut down the production line for those vehicles. And, you know, quite frankly, this, this is one, one thing that critics of Tesla have, have said that uh, competitors are, are beating Tesla on, which is delivery of, of, of this higher end luxury vehicle. Now, S and X, in my personal opinion, are a little bit long in the tooth, especially when you compare it to the three and the Y. I still think that there is a market for that higher end electric vehicle. I know Galley from Hyperchange thinks that, that Tesla should discontinue the Model X, but I still think that there's a market for those two vehicles, especially if they refresh them. So are those two vehicles something that you have um, a lot of hope on uh, in, in terms of the bottom line of Tesla and are there any other vehicles that, that you're really looking forward to this year? So yeah, I think we can start with the S and the X. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that we haven't heard anything yet because they were supposed to restart production yesterday. So, you know, if there has been a refresh, they're, they're doing a great job still of keeping that, you know, somewhat uh, close to their vest. So, you know, we'll see in the coming days if we hear anything on that. Um, I would agree. I think they're probably ready for a refresh. Um, there are just little things that I think can be updated that uh, will give customers more confidence that, okay, you know, I can go out and I can spend $70,000, $100,000, $120,000 on, on this car. Uh, you know, we've heard these rumors of refreshes now for really since the Model 3, you know, started production back in mid-2017. So those rumors, even if they're not grounded in reality, that still impacts your sales because if customers are expecting that, they're just going to try and wait until that actually happens. Um, and to some extent, you know, I'm, I'm an example of that because I, I placed my order for the model three, the day they came out with that, the update, you know, increasing the range by 8% and, you know, updating the trim, updating the center console, things like that. It's like, okay, well, Tesla just made these updates. I can be confident now that, you know, at least for a little bit of period of time, um, this will be sort of like the newest model, you know, Tesla moves quickly. They always are updating little things that maybe the customers don't really understand or don't really see. So they're sort of in a way, always refreshing things, but you know, if we see a horizontal screen, uh, if we see sort of that center interior camera, if we see um, them switch over to 2170 battery cells or 4680 battery cells, that's going to give people a lot more confidence in saying, okay, now's the right time for me to, to make this purchase. So um, in terms of the actual impact to Tesla's business, I think the reason they haven't done a refresh is because it's, it's pretty small um, and it's just getting smaller every single day. Uh, you know, if, if we say a hundred thousand dollar average selling price and Tesla's doing, you know, 60,000 of these per year, even if they bring it up to a hundred thousand, you're still looking at six to $10 billion in revenue, you know, for Tesla in 2019, that would have been 40% of the company's revenue. If we go out to 2022, that's going to be probably less than 10%, just doing rough math off the top of my head of the company. And that from there, it just continues to decrease and the market for that price vehicle is is just too small for that to ever be material to Tesla's financials going forward. And maybe it could generate a, a larger share of the profits, but you know, it's just not Tesla's strategy. They're trying to get as, as much of as many vehicles out on the road as they can. That's why the focus is on Model 3, Model Y, ramping up Shanghai, not on refreshing the S and the X. And that's why Elon has even said, you know, at some point it might not even make sense to make them. 
they're just they're just becoming smaller and smaller. Um, I do still hope Tesla keeps them around. I think they're great vehicles. I think they add a lot of you know brand value to to what Tesla does, especially the Model X. Um, you know, it's, it's very iconic. So I think there's a lot of potential for Tesla to to still do a lot of these things with these vehicles, and you know maybe make them a little bit more premium in terms of the interior or whatever else. But um, yeah, definitely I definitely don't want them to to exit the the vehicle lineup. Um, and then in terms of what I'm excited for in 2021, you know I think I'd probably join 95% of people in saying the Cybertruck. Uh, that's that's the clear focus I think for for the later half of this year, at least hopefully. Um, but then in addition to that, I would say the Model Y from Berlin and Texas, I would view that as also a new product line. And I think that's going to be extremely exciting. You know, Elon has talked in the past about how the Model Y from Berlin is just going to be completely different. There's going to be game changing new technology. They've now talked about a lot of that stuff at um, at Battery Day with, you know, the mega casting stuff, the 4680 cells, all the dry battery electrode stuff, tablets, batteries. If, if all this stuff or at least some of this stuff can make it into the Model Y, that's probably going to be our first chance to see of, okay, here are the benefits of all the things that Tesla was talking about at Battery Day in a tangible product. And we're now seeing the impact on price that, that this stuff is having. So that would probably be, in addition to Cybertruck, what I'm most excited for for 2021. What type of, of delivery number impact will Cybertruck have this year? Do you have any, any guesses or estimates on that? I mean, if I were putting it in a spreadsheet, trying to give... You know, my best guess, I would say maybe like 10,000. Um, it's not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I wouldn't be surprised if it's nothing. Um, I think Tesla's got so much going on this year that the Cybertruck is probably not priority one. I think they want to get Model Y ramped up in Berlin and Texas first, um, as you know, all signs are pointing to that. And that's an extremely ambitious project in and of itself without bringing in Cybertruck where you know, it's a completely new vehicle design, completely new manufacturing process that Tesla's going to be using for the Cybertruck. So to do that, in addition to all the new stuff that they're doing from from Battery Day for the Model Y here initially, is just a lot to take on. Um, so I, I'm not super hopeful in terms of deliveries for Cybertruck this year. Um, I think it's probably more of a 2022 type of thing. But, you know, hopefully if we can see any any Cybertrucks rolling out the line this year, I'll be super happy with that. And he, even Elon Musk seemed to tamp the expectations with production of the truck, saying that it is a new way to create a vehicle. And, and, and so perhaps even he's realizing that the, the speed to ramp up volume production for the truck may not be as easy as what people are thinking. Yeah, and it's tough because I think they designed it with ease of manufacturing in mind. So I think, you know, they approach things from a first principle perspective and from a first principle perspective, the Cybertruck makes a ton of sense in terms of how it's designed. Sandy Monroe at Monroe and Associates has talked a lot about that. He's obviously super excited about it, but at the same time, it's new. So you got to figure out how to do all that stuff and figuring all that out, that can be a lengthy process. So once they figure all that out, yeah, this is going to be the best way to produce this vehicle, but there's going to be, you know, some pain in between zero and the first 10,000 units of trying to get through figuring out a lot of those um, processes. So, you know, hopefully they can make a start on that this year, but I would definitely not expect big volume because of those things. And like you said, Elon is, you know, on Twitter a couple of times, put out some hedging on that, or at least uh, a little bit of a disclaimer of like, hey, this is all new stuff. It's gonna, it's gonna take some time. So I think it's good to set our expectations accordingly with that. Any other vehicles that you're looking forward to in 2021? We've heard some discussion about the semi-truck. Does that have a, a large impact on Tesla's business? Yeah, someday it will. Um, again, I don't think it's the 2021 thing in terms of, you know, impacting the financials. I think it, I view it sort of similar as the Cybertruck. Uh, Tesla's probably, again, still got bigger priorities this year. Uh, but it's that's kind of been the case for the last couple of years. And, you know, I think we all expected to have the semi by now. Once Tesla gets the 4680s, their own internal battery cell production up and running, that really is the unlock for the semi. And again, I think the first place we're going to see that is the Model Y. Um, so that's why kind of, you know, my focus is on that right now. Um, and then I think a lot of these other things sort of fall out after that. So super excited about the semi. It's going to be, you know, completely game changing in my opinion, but it's not something that I think is going to be that big for 2021. But we did have Elon, you know, I don't know, maybe six months ago or something, 
kind of when all the, the Nicholas stuff was going on, he, he sent out that leaked email that said like, Hey, now's the time to bring the semi to, you know, to production or whatever he said. I can't remember the exact word, but, um, you know, it's, it seemed like they were kind of ready to, to start something, but then we really haven't heard much since then. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. Same with the roadster. <laughs> exactly. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm personally excited about the roadster. I, I made a decision, uh, maybe, maybe foolishly, maybe not. I'll, I'll let people know once I take delivery of it. But I, I did tell Tesla that I would be, I would be placing an order in with a, with a discount from referrals. And a big thanks to many of you who are watching who, who use the referral code. But um, you know, the, these two products, the Semi and the Roadster, will be very low volume. I think uh, Tesla plans to make a thousand of the Roadsters, and I don't know what type of volume production Tesla plans for with the Semi truck, but. Uh, most certainly, it won't won't be won't be large volumes like what we're seeing with Model Y and Model Three. So, I personally am, am excited about that. But when I think about big picture and what's going to have the biggest impact, what what Tesla investors should be following and paying attention to those those two product lines probably aren't at the top of the list as you indicated. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the energy side of Tesla's business. Um, I was just yesterday, in fact, I'm going back out today, but I was, I was just on site with a, a roofing company who is installing a solar roof on a house not too far away from where I'm at. And uh, th this, this product is pretty exciting. This, this, this product, once they sort of iron out things and can get that install time down to an, an efficient level, I think, um, I, I think that there's some, some really good prospect there for that. So energy side of business, how much of that plays into 2021 uh, success for Tesla? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think Tesla investors really love to hear about the energy business because it's not something that we spend a lot of time talking about or thinking about, or maybe we do thinking about, but certainly in the mainstream media, you know, you, you rarely ever hear anything about Tesla energy. So it's a super exciting area. I think in Q4, Tesla energy was maybe like 6% of Tesla's revenue. From a financial perspective, I don't really see that changing too significantly over the next few years. I think Tesla, you know, we'll focus in on batteries for a second, then we'll talk about solar. Um, but from a, you know, mega pack, power, power pack, power wall perspective, I think Tesla's going to continue to be battery constrained. And when they are battery constrained, it's going to make um, most of the time, it's going to make more sense to put those vehicles into or to put those batteries into a vehicle. Not only are they going to capture more revenue per battery cell, in a vehicle just right off the start every vehicle that tesla gets out on the road has the potential to continue to generate revenue for them in the future with a robo taxi type of tesla network situation so there's there's no reason to allocate a battery to energy when you can put it into a, a vehicle so i think over the next few years we're going to continue to see this you know a lot of potential for the battery storage business from Tesla, but not a lot of realization of that potential. Um, we'll see, we'll see steady growth for sure. And maybe it does grow a bit quicker than auto, but I don't expect it to be anywhere close to, you know, I think long-term Elon has said it could really be 50% of the business. I don't expect anything close to that. You know, the next five years, maybe when we get into 2025, 2030, we start to see it become a larger percent of the business, but, um, it's definitely going to take some time and for good reason. On the solar side of the business, they don't face those same constraints because it's not a battery related business. You know, there's synergies with ramping up batteries and, you know, you could use that as a reason to, to get more energy out um, in the market. But um, with solar, you know, we just had the federal tax credit extension of 26% that was scheduled to go down to 23% in 2021 and then 0% after that for residential solar. That's now been extended by two years. So there's a lot of opportunity here over the next couple of years as Tesla seems to now have figured out both their rooftop solar business in terms of how they're offering it to the customer, how they're presenting the pricing, um, how they're installing and things like that. And then, you know, Elon has been really pretty bullish now on the solar roof for, for quite some time. And we haven't really seen massive production of that yet or massive installations of those yet. Um, but to your point now, you're starting to see a little bit more of those. You're starting to see some videos pop up on YouTube. I think there was one a couple days ago where uh, somebody in Florida, some resort there had installed like a 44 kilowatt system. So uh, right, right with the solar roof. So, you know, I, th I think there's a lot, a lot to be excited about with the solar business. Um, that's probably what I'm going to be most interested in, in terms of Tesla energy these next couple of years, because uh, I think the timing is right. But you know, Tesla has to figure out that installation problem. And unfortunately, 
installing solar is, you know, currently it's a very manual process. So hopefully Tesla can do some, some good things in that space, but to some extent they're going to be a little, a little limited by, um, you know, the manual aspect of that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, um, being on site yesterday, it got me really excited about, about how Tesla's engineered this, this tile. They're much bigger. If you haven't seen them in person, they're much bigger than what Tesla revealed three or four years ago at their, at the product launch of the, the, the solar roof. So they've, they've made them larger, which of course makes it, it makes it go faster to, to install them. And the way that they've engineered the, the back side of it is, I think, really quite intelligent. So they've got these, these clips in there and uh, they, they, they sort of clip onto the, to the brackets. And then there's these portions that extend beyond the, the, the tile where, where they get hammered in and affixed to the actual uh, house roof. And, uh, and, and so the, the live tiles have the, have the wiring in the back, and of course they also have the, the inactive or non-live non tiles as well, and there's no wiring connected to those. But the, the way that they engineered this, I, I think is really, really intelligent. And if, if they're trying to sort of um, rethink what a roof looks like and the roof install, I think that they've set themselves up, in my personal opinion, to to do this pretty quickly now this this I checked in with the roofing roofing company today they started yesterday morning at 7:30 a.m. and uh, when I checked in with them today they said that the install was completely done so uh, this was a this is a 12 kilowatt system and um, in terms of square footage of the size of the roof I don't quite remember but this is a a, a one story ranch there wasn't a whole lot of pitch. Um, in, in difficulty to the to the roof, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a future video that, that that I'm that I'm working on for it, and get some nice I've got some nice drone footage of the roof, but um, getting it down to a day install, I, I want to say, and, and maybe you, you've you've got recollection of this, but I, I want to say that Elon or Tesla said that that's their goal to get it down to a day install versus multiple days. Do you do you seem to recall any conversations about that? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, maybe just because you're saying it, but to me it does sound familiar of, of that being their target. And you know, I've seen cases where it's taken four or five days or something like that. Um, so to hear that it, it is down to a day, at least in some cases, on maybe an easier install is, is definitely a good sign. How did it look to you in person? It looked clean. It looked really, really clean. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a black tempered glass, and the active tiles have the, of course, solar built in. And you have to really, when when you look at it straight, it's difficult to see. You have to really get it at a, at a particular angle to really tell that the that, that the, the the PV is is built into it. And um, when when I was talking to the roofing company, they said that the um, uh, where Tesla wants to be with the strength of it, uh, they're not quite there in terms of product development. So I don't remember the terminology, and I'll have to. Uh, I, the, the interview that I did with one of the representatives at the at the roofing company will be integrated into the the video summary. But um, they've got some they've got some room and improvement there. But overall, they I, I, I think that they've really sort of like re rethought how something so complex. Can be installed in a really fast way. So, in terms of design, it looks beautiful. Um, in terms of install, which is going to be a large part of making this product successful, it appears like they've they've thought about the right things. And hmm, my guess is that they'll probably improve that as well and try and find find ways to to um, streamline that install process. Yeah, and I think that's what's so exciting is you know when Tesla finds a problem and focuses on a problem, you tend to see really great results out of that. And, um, you know, I have no reason to doubt that they'll they'll do the same with solar roof. I think they've been criticized for sort of how long this has taken, but, you know, it's, it's a new business line. It's something that no one has ever done with success before. So um, to see it take a little bit longer than, you know, what they'd originally hoped isn't, isn't surprising. But over time, Tesla tends to accomplish, you know, what they set out to do. So I think the solar roof is going to end up the same. And, you know, to the impact on the financials, it's there's a ton of potential here. Um, you know, you you may know better than me because I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, you know, every new home that's built in the United States every year, you know, why why not have a solar roof if the costs are comparable? It's just it's going to start making a ton of sense on the, on those new installs, um, and then obviously in in the case where someone's replacing a roof too. So, 
I want to say that's like a million or something a year. I can't even remember that. Maybe it's 10 million, but um, it's a significant market for the size that uh, Tesla is, or for the the average selling price that a roof is going to carry for Tesla. Right. Um, In this particular example, this homeowner had to replace his roof, um, I think because of hail damage. The company assessed the roof. The roofing company assessed the roof and determined that there was some hail damage and did warrant a roof replacement. So the the, the, the insurance company did pay for a cost of that, and then this particular homeowner then paid the, the, the out of pocket, remaining out of pocket for the, the total cost of Tesla solar roof. So costs will fall. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that, especially when, when volume is sort of ramped up. And um, uh, so, you know, I, I don't think that it's, it's on par cost wise with an asphalt shingle roof. Which, which is one of the most inexpensive roofs that you can, you can install, but probably at the moment is, is in line with a you know, higher-end tile, uh, tile style roofing that you see in a lot of higher-end homes. So hopefully one day the cost falls so much and you know, so many people are installing them on their, on their roof that it does become somewhat in line with um, what many people have on their roofs, which is the asphalt shingle style. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so let's um, let's take a couple of questions from Twitter here because we've got a lot of great ones. We won't be able to cover all of them, but I will hit some here that I think are really interesting and that I think um, my viewers and anyone who's coming over from your channel will enjoy. So this is from John Hanna. He asks, as revenue goes up and growth rate potentially slows, does he see, do, does, do you, Rob, see the... Uh, PE ratio is starting to decline through 2021, or will they hold? Yeah, that's a good question. So the PE ratio, for anyone not familiar, that's just price to earnings. So the share price divided by the earnings per share uh, that Tesla's delivering. So right now that's at about uh, 1600 or 1700 X. Uh, the S&P 500 for context trades at 38 X. So Tesla's obviously got a super high price to earnings ratio right now. Uh, but that's just because they've just flipped over to becoming profitable. You know, a year ago, Tesla would not have even had a price to earnings ratio because they weren't earning anything. They had negative earnings. Uh, so as Tesla continues to grow revenue and grow earnings um, to even a greater degree than revenue is generally what happens when you're you know, starting to scale up. So let's say they grow revenue at 50%, earnings might grow at something like 100% uh, just as they recognize those economies of scale. So as that happens, uh, the price to earnings is going to come down. Um, you know, if, if they're growing earnings 100% every year, the stock would have to double every year to keep up with that for the price to earnings ratio to not come down. I don't think anyone expects Tesla's share price to double every single year. You know, from here to 2030, that would lead to an astronomical price target that Tesla would have like the entire, you know, capital market <laughs> in terms of its uh, actual market value. So something like that wouldn't be feasible, but Tesla can definitely continue to grow earnings at 100% for quite a long time. So naturally what is going to happen as Tesla's numbers grow, grow bigger is that price to earnings ratio is going to come down. That doesn't mean the stock price is going to fall. The stock price can continue to grow. It just wouldn't grow as fast as earnings. And that's completely natural. Um, if you look back at, you know, how, how companies like that weren't originally profitable, uh, that were, you know, high growth that then eventually shift over to being profitable. Like Amazon's a great comparison for Tesla. I think you could look at a company like Netflix. A lot of companies have gone through this stage. Um, the price to earnings definitely does naturally come down over time. I still think we'll see a higher price to earnings for Tesla than we would see for um, a lot of other companies just because of the opportunity for future growth. But uh, I don't expect it to stay at 1600 or 1700 for for very long. <laughs> right. Uh, we got a lot of people asking about the uh, tenure outlook EPS. What do you see there? This, the, the, there's so many things that could happen in the next 10 years, but do you have any initial thoughts? Uh, yeah, I do. It's something that I kind of am working on behind the scenes, so probably not anything that we can go into too much detail on today. But um, I think the best way to think about stocks is, is very directionally. Um, and, you know, I, I have pretty high confidence that in 10 years, Tesla's going to be the, the number one producer of, of automotive uh, in the world. I have pretty high confidence that by that point, they're going to have solved um, autonomy, you know, to at least to some extent where they can generate significant revenue and high margin revenue off of that. Uh, And if you view that as the case, it's, it's pretty easy to run through some numbers and say, um, you know, what, what Tesla might be worth at that point in time. So, and that number is obviously quite a bit higher than it is today. So that's, that's generally how I think of things. I don't think you need some huge, you know, 
2000 line spreadsheet going through an EPS forecast or anything like that. I think it's a lot of this, a lot of that would be too, um, too detailed to actually take much away from other than just to kind of ground yourself in, in what's possible. And I think, you know, you can do that with a spreadsheet that's probably 10 lines long. So, um, I, I tend to think more in, in, in directions in terms of like what's going to happen in the future from, uh, an overall market perspective rather than trying to think of it in terms of what's happening in the spreadsheet. I think we'll, we'll wrap up with one last question and that is. What competition does Tesla have to consider in 2021, if any at all? Are there some companies that are producing some electric vehicles this year that you think will provide a a run for Tesla's money? Yeah, so Tesla, you know, that's been the the common refrain of Tesla Tesla bears for the last few years as competition is coming. I think over the last you know 12 to 18 months, we've started to see competition actually finally arrive um, in terms of actually offering a product. Uh, how competitive it is with Tesla, certainly up for debate, but nothing on the market right now seems to be able to compete with what Tesla has to offer from, you know, whether it's an efficiency perspective, range perspective, dollars per, uh, per functionality in terms of range or, um, from an autonomy perspective, there's, there's just nothing that overall is, is competitive with Tesla right now. Um, I don't really see that changing over the next few years. Certainly there are going to be more electric vehicles on the market, but you know, People make the mistake of saying, oh, there's this fixed electric vehicle market and these new electric vehicles are going to eat into Tesla's electric vehicle market share. There's there's no electric vehicle market share like there is if you want to define it that way. But that's a silly way of looking at things. There's just a vehicle share, a vehicle market. And yeah, maybe some people in that 80 million to 100 million vehicles per year market, their needs aren't going to be satisfied with an electric vehicle. but the electric vehicle share today is, you know, two or 3%. Certainly of the 80 to hundred million customers buying new cars every year, their needs can be met with an electric vehicle much more than two or 3% of those people. So we need to look at the market as, as a total automotive, um, unit. And we need to compare how electric vehicles are growing over time to internal combustion engines. Um, rather than trying to say like, oh, the ID4 in Norway has this market share and Tesla has this market share. And obviously Tesla is, you know, losing the battle there. It's just, that's not, <laughs> it's not how, how things are going to work, uh, this decade. So, and, and I think since I brought that point up, that's one of the, like the most frustrating things. Um, it, it's kind of like a trigger for me is when people compare those like individual markets and try to compare these individual EVs in individual countries. First of all, the data is not always great. Second of all, when we when we do that, there's no context around like, oh, Tesla has localized manufacturing here or or they don't. So like if we're comparing something like Norway or the Netherlands or, you know, the UK, you know, which has been good for Tesla, all those comparisons are really irrelevant until Tesla has localized manufacturing because they're competing with a company there that has localized manufacturing. So if you're going to do that, you also have to compare, okay, Tesla's market share in the United States versus these other electric vehicles, which by and large, aren't even available here yet. So um, kind of off topic there, but uh, it is, it, you need to, people need to start looking a little bit higher level, um, thinking about total automotive share, thinking about worldwide versus trying to focus in on, you know, those little things that aren't really all that important. I agree. And I would add to that, that I, I suspect that uh, Tesla may be moving into this phase where they're not, they're, they're, they're not converting existing electric vehicle customers. They are converting, you know, gas-powered customers to electric. And when you do look at that that market share of, of vehicles that are sold globally, there's enough for everyone. There, there's there's enough volume in business to, or demand rather for everyone to be successful with their electric vehicle lineups. So I don't I don't necessarily think I, I think it's a little bit too. Um, uh, you know, to ground level, and and people should really focus on the, the the overall the overall optics of okay, hundreds ten, tens of millions of, of cars are being sold each year globally, um, and if Tesla has only sold let's say half a million vehicles, there's you know there, there's enough room for everyone to be successful with their electric vehicle lineups, in my opinion, and they're probably going to come from people who are driving gas vehicles. In converting them to electric. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we talk about 2030, you know, kind of a best case scenario is Tesla delivering 20 million vehicles that year. That still leaves 75% of the market up for grabs. So like 
go and have that other 75%, whoever wants it. You know, I think there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of companies in China doing, uh, going after that very aggressively. You know, we have XPeng, Neo, BYD, um, probably some others. In the US, we have companies like Rivia and Lucid. Um, and then certainly, you know, in, in Europe, VW seems to be making a very strong play in terms of uh, what they're what they're pursuing. We'll see how effective they are in that, but certainly they're trying to push for it too. So there's tons of market up for grabs uh, and, you know, that's not that's not the constraint uh, for Tesla's is market share demand. I think, you know, there are a few surveys out there for automotive consumers, and I think something like eighty percent, you know, probably depends on the survey, but something like sixty to eighty percent of respondents have noted that they would consider an electric vehicle for their next purchase. So, <laughs> if we apply that to the total market, that means you know, forty million plus consumers out there that are ready to start thinking about an electric vehicle when maybe there's a few million maybe like two or three million vehicles per year that are EVs right now. So, you know, you're going to have to 20X the entire market to, to satisfy that demand, which is only going to continue to increase. All right, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up here. So, uh, Rob, thank you so much for coming on. You have a, a, a very successful podcast. And for the few people that are unaware of it or, or listening to you for the very first time, how can people access this podcast and any other things that, that you're that you're doing in terms of content wise? Sure. Yeah, pretty simple. So any podcast platform or on YouTube, just go and search for Tesla Daily it should pop up. Uh, the YouTube channel is just youtube.com slash Tesla Daily. And then I am also on Twitter uh, at Tesla Podcast. And uh, I seem to recall, because because of your background there, are you doing something with the street? Yeah, uh, so I do post my videos over there um, and occasionally write some articles as well. So that's at thestreet.com slash Tesla. Rob, thanks again for coming on. It was a great chat with you and um, maybe we'll touch base in another year. For those that are watching, I'd love to hear some of your key takeaways from watching this discussion here. Put it in the comments down below and I'll catch everyone on the next video. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it.